So now let's talk about the base of the fifth, which is a common area of, of injury uh, that we need to talk about. Uh, so classically, there are three types of fractures uh, at the base of the fifth. Uh, one is an avulsion fracture, predominantly from uh, traction from the perineus brevis and a plantar fascia attachment to the base of the fifth, really more the tip of the base of the fifth, which occur at the tuberosity, approximately. Then there's a no man's land here between the, the, the uh, tuberosity and the diaphysis of the fifth metatarsal, uh, where you can get really two types of fractures uh, in this particular area. And it's, uh, this is not right at the tip, uh, but with uh, one and a half centimeters is the typical cutoff uh, from the end of the bone in toward the metaphysis. Okay, and then here we can see the perineus brevis tendon attaches here and the, uh, uh, and the plantar fascia coming across here. Uh, <clears throat> so there are typically defined three types of fractures that occur in this location. One is an avulsion fracture, uh, typically in plantar flexion, where you have avulsion from the uh, primarily the perineus brevis tendon attachment here, uh, which pulls off the bone, and that's usually just the distal tip, the tuberosity. Then there's a type two, uh, which is a fracture at the at the uh, uh, metaphyseal diaphyseal junction in in between here, uh, which is commonly called a Jones fracture. Uh, but the nomenclature here uh, is not uniformly uh, agreed upon, at least not uniformly used in clinical practice. Uh, a, a true Jones fracture is an acute injury. Uh, we'll talk about the mechanism in a minute. <clears throat> uh, and then uh, a little bit more distal, but often the, the locations of the acute Jones fracture and the chronic what people call a stress fracture, which is basically a repetitive traumatic injury uh, type of things rather than an acute sports medicine injury, occurs a little bit more distally involving really the proximal diaphysis. Uh, but that's very much debated, and I don't think you can clearly dif differentiate these two simply based upon uh, imaging location and findings. Uh, but classically, it's divided into these three an avulsion fracture, a Jones fracture, and a stress fracture. And this is uh, another way to kind of look at it. In another article here, we see the traction uh, avulsion fractures, the Jones fractures, and then a stress fracture here, really at the base of the diaphysis of the bone in these uh, locations. But again, what I find in clinical practice it's not so easy to differentiate these just based upon location. Uh, now, uh, Torg, orthopedic surgeon, uses basically a similar classification called, called, the cord, called uh, Torg classifications, uh, where you can get an avulsion fracture at the tuberosity. <laughs> then you can get acute Jones fractures, but you, even here you've got an early phase, a delayed phase, and a non-union. And then the stress fracture, which also can be type 1, 2, or 3, which are usually a little bit more distal, but are due to repetitive strain on the bones rather than an acute traumatic injury. Mm -hmm. uh, and to, to differentiate between the types 1, 2, and 3 of the stress fracture and the acute uh, Jones fracture, basically type 1, you have sharp delineated fracture line, you've got edema usually on both sides by MR, no sclerotic bone at the margins, and uh, you don't have uh, cortical hypertrophy at the early stage. This is before you start getting get a healing response. Then there's a delayed union, just like other fractures of the bone. You start seeing a, a, a fracture line, you start seeing a, a response to the bone involving the cortices where you start getting healing response, typically on both sides. You start seeing periosteal callus formation. Periosteum, as you know, is very important in, in healing uh, these kind of fractures. And you can get intramedullary sclerosis. Uh, and, and this can be variable and can be up to six months before you can get healing. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, we, in these cases, we like to get a CT scan because sometimes I think we can see the, the 
early bony bridging of the fracture better with CT than with MR. And then type 3 is a non-union. You tend to have a widened fracture line. You have the sclerotic margins on both sides. And uh, uh, that sclerotic margin really goes all the way across with no evidence of uh, bridging uh, uh, bony formation. Genesis. So, uh, and this just, I think, shows a lot of what we're talking about here. So, um, so anyway, this is basically the avulsion fractures at the base can be longitudinal uh, or it can be transverse. Uh, and it, it can be extra articular, just involving the tip. Uh, but it can involve the metatarsal cuboid joint uh, as well. Surgically, the indications are if it's commuted or displaced, uh, or if it involves a significant amount of the cuboid metatarsal articulation. And you can get a delayed union with these, but most of these are treated non-surgical. Here's kind of an example of a avulsion fractures of the base of the fifth. J John, do you want to say something about these? Well, um, some that's one, two, three, uh, it can be four and five also. Uh, okay. The thing is, uh, it, the fractures vary in terms of location in many different settings, depending on the type of injury and whatever. But uh, usually, uh, if it involves the joint, uh, like this particular fracture, um, this is a fracture from a, a, a muscle uh, tendon pull. So yeah. usually, these are treated uh, with a cast or a boot, depending on how brave you are. And usually, they will heal in the usual period of time, uh, six weeks or so. Okay. Um, the other fractures, um, most of them wind up surgical. Um, the so-called two and, and, and three are operated on. Um, nobody wants to wait six months in a cast and then find out they need surgery. That, that doesn't make any sense. So uh, those are usually um, operated on. Of course, it depends on the patient, I guess. Okay. Uh, Thank you. But these are tricky. And uh, I have treated uh, the twos a few times in a cast, and the patients weren't too happy being in a cast for three months. Um, but they healed. So uh, I figured that they, they shouldn't uh, have any complaints. I've treated fours in a cast, and they heal. Um, so it depends on the patient, and depends on the surgeon. Okay. And, uh, you, the main thing is you've got to tell them, tell them uh, what the situation is, and uh, okay. Uh, okay, that's the way it is in surgery. Good. So this would be the avulsion type fracture, and as John says, typically people say these have a good prognosis. Then there's the Joan fractures, which are a little bit more uh, distal. They're generally transverse fractures. Uh, you can often get them comminuted, which makes the, the healing more difficult. And uh, and then this is a typical location. The circulation proximal to to, to the head of the uh, metatarsal, I guess the tail of the metatarsal or whatever, um, it, it doesn't have very good circulation in the metatarsal area. And, and that's uh, the cause of non-unions. But if you immobilize them very well, uh, it's possible to heal them. And, uh, but almost always, in fact, every time I treated these conservatively, uh, it took a, a, quite a while to heal. And it, 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 it was frustrating. Okay. Now, this is the one kind of in between. This is a classic Jones-type fracture, which we can see here. It's distally located rather than at the tuberosity or the tip here. Uh, not, uh, it's really in the metaphysis, not really all the way to the diaphysis. Uh, and then uh, more proximally, you can, or more distally, you can get uh, diaphysteal stress fractures. Uh, 
And uh, with these, uh, it tends to have, uh, uh, during training season, repetitive trauma. Uh, generally, they'll have a period of pain before they, they actually get the severe pain. Uh, so it just shows that these aren't really acute injuries. These are more a constellation of, of, of repetitive. Uh, one of the things I forgot to mention, John, is the fact that uh, uh, if there's any displacement in the two and three, uh, then, then you're obligated to operate. Thank you. Great. And so here we can see a comminuted fracture, primarily involving the tuberosity, which we there, which was a, an avulsion type fracture. Now that looks like it's had, had another fracture before this. Yeah, probably so. Okay, Robert, what do you think? A little uh, ossicle proximal to the. Can you go back on that? That tiny little ossicle right below your arrow, right there. I think that's an old injury. What do you think? Uh, yeah, well, I, actually, I think this is an acute avulsion injury here, and this may be more of a chronic injury uh, involving more the base of the tuberosity. But uh, uh, okay, yeah, this, this one's displaced. the radiologist. Well, this one kind of has sharp margins. We can see that there's some displacement here. Anyway, and then uh, let's see, Robert, what do you think of this case? Uh, here, it looks like there's a fracture through the base of the fifth metatarsal. I think this would be a Jones fracture. Yeah, so I think a lot of people would call these Jones fractures. Technically, based upon the papers that we've just gone over, this really is involving more of the proximal end of the diaphysis, and is, it would be more typically seen in the stress fracture uh, realm. Which puts... I, I was, I'm sorry, John. Uh, I was brought up uh, that this is a Jones fracture. Okay, right, and 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 I find right, and I, and I find clinically distinguishing the this the stress fracture at the proximal end of the diaphysis from a Jones fracture, which is more in the metaphysis. Just is not a. Uh, universally commonly used terminology this despite the it depends on how old the surgeon is and where where he was trained <laughs> okay uh the the bottom line is that the, the both of these are at increased risk for non-union some people believe the more metaphyseal fractures are a worse prognosis than the diaphyseal fractures but uh, uh my experience uh, uh these are both pretty high-risk lesions. And we can see uh, this does look like it may be a little bit more on the chronic. We don't see the nice sharp margins. Uh, they're kind of irregular. We see ebernation on either side. We don't really see a nice clear fracture line. This looks more like the kind of stress fractures that we've seen uh, elsewhere in the body. Uh, but this was called a Jones fracture uh, by the orthopedic surgeon. And you can see the edema uh, on both sides. Okay. Uh, Campbell's uh, uh, considers a Jones fracture that involves uh, the superior margin of the um, metaphysis uh, at the joint line. So, uh, if if you go along with uh, Campbell's, which most people do, that's what that is. Okay. So you're right in that sense, but I was. I was brought up uh, with, with the Jones fracture being further now. As uh, as you see here, it says Jones fracture, and 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 this is at, at the junction of the metaphysis and the uh, diaphysis. Right. It, it really doesn't make too damn much of a difference. The treatment is just pretty much the same. Okay. Okay, Tayson, what do you think of this one? All right, so this one also has a transverse uh, fracture through the proximal diaphysis of the fifth metatarsal. Yeah, so now this would notice you've got thickening of the cortex, hibernation, hypertrophic bone formation. So this is not an acute injury. Yeah. This is more of a, of a chronic injury. Uh, because you can see there's been a healing response here, 
But on the other hand, uh, we're, we're not seeing uh, cortex going all the way across here. So, and this is probably in the process of trying to heal, but there's enough motion here, which is keeping uh, the uh, good uh, healing response from, from actually healing the fracture. And, and that's a delayed risk. union. Yeah, so this this is either delayed union or if you go on and keep following it and it never becomes a union, it can be a non-union. But at this point, I think, yeah, as John said, this would best to call this a delayed union. And then here we can see the edema in that particular area. And this was called a chronic Jones fracture. Okay. Elior. The microphone is cut off. I can't hear you guys. Can you hear us now? Yeah. Good. So if we go back here, we can see that the margins are irregular. There is sclerotic change involving both margins, and there's a lot of separation here between the bones. So you'd really have to, you'd really want to know uh, how old this is. Fracture, you know, if it's a six weeks old, then it could still be a delayed union. But th with this degree of separation, you'd have to call out the orthopedic surgeon and say it's, it's uh, even if it's only six weeks old, this is unlikely to, to heal on its own uh, because it's so separated. Uh, <clears throat> I think John was telling us earlier that this would be a, a case of a clear need, need for surgery. And here, what, what else do you see here on that? Coronal images. Um, so, uh, like scar tissue, like on a lateral. Well, path. we can see here. Here's all that uh, granulation tissue. Granulation, the granulation tissue here, and then here we can see that there is a prominent separation here mm -hmm. uh, in the end. Uh, but but this was an old old enough. Mm -hmm. It was chronic. I think it was over six months old, and this was a non-union. And you really would like to treat these much sooner than this. Uh, J John, do you want to talk to us a little bit about the risks of waiting till these are non-unions before you try mm -hmm. to fix them? John, are you with us? Oh. Looks like we lost your goodness. Well, we'll come back. Okay. John, are you with us? John, are you on mute? Did you hit the mute button? Okay, 15 year old ballerina pain on point. Uh, there's a demon that's second metatarsal. Um, be concerned about a stress injury. I don't think I see a fracture. Yeah, right. I agree with you. I think that's a stress injury. And again, when you're on point, the, the longest uh, uh, metatarsal bone is really the second. That's what uh, all the pressure is on. When you go on point as a ballerina, so this was a a, a common between the second and the first, and the first, but the second is really a very common location, kind of for the same reason that you, you got Freiburg's infraction is most common involving the second metatarsal head, and and uh, uh, people are wear high heels. Okay, uh, Robert, John, are you back with us yet? Um, you made it. Where'd you go? Somehow I, I got on the video. 
I, okay. I've been gotcha. coming in and out with the sound, and uh, well, I'm trying to get rid of the video, and I can't. Well, uh, don't worry about the video. Well, that's that's okay. Uh, so th this was a non-union. Uh, do, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, uh, waiting till you till you have a chronic non-union like this before you try treating it? Uh, John, are you still with us? Yes. Oh, I can I can hear you, but I'm still having trouble with that. Oh, you you can't see the images. The images, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Okay, we'll, we'll just keep going. Go, go ahead, and uh, I'll get in when I get in. Well, why don't you go out and come back in again, and you'll probably... That's be able probably to what images. I'm going to do. Yeah, okay. Okay, Taysom, what do you think of this case? All right, so looking at the navicular, it looks like there's marrow edema without collapse. Looks like a stress yeah. injury. Yeah, I don't know why I put that here, but I did. Good. Okay, uh, Oleg. Hmm. 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 Let's see it. Um, um yeah. Uh so uh like a thin, like a Okay, so so the navicular is abnormal here. Abnormal liver, yeah, abnormal. It's, abnormal. it's de yeah. decreased. It's, thin, it's thin, thin here. Thin, thin liver, it's yeah. also abnormally oriented with respect to the talus. See a lot of degenerative disease in the talus navicular joint. Mm -hmm. Now you can see kind of flattening out of the of the navicular. So what is this called? I don't know. Okay, this is called the Müller Weiss syndrome, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, it's uh, generally talked about being spontaneous osteonecrosis, which I think is wrong. But still, uh, almost all the articles and books say that this is due to uh, basically a osteonecrosis or an infarct within the uh, the navicular bone. Uh, I think this is due to chronic repetitive trauma. Uh, as we've seen over and over again, and you see all the time on uh, when you read MRs of the ankle, the navicular is a commonly injured bone because a lot of the forces uh, that go down through the the body into the foot and toes go right through the uh, uh, the navicular. And I think Miller Weiss is a chronic repetitive impaction trauma uh, to the bone, which causes it to flatten and the trabecular bone to to become broken. So I think it's a repetitive traumatic injury and not due to uh, Oops, gotta let John back in. Uh, not not due to uh, infarct of the navicular bone, and it needs to be treated like a traumatic, a chronic, repetitive traumatic injury. Okay, so here looking again at the. Navicular bone, kind of the central and lateral portion looks more sclerotic. Yeah, it's, um, been, it's markedly flattened here laterally. Mm, okay. Uh, yeah, maybe even a little rotated medially. And then uh, here's what that looks like on an MR examination. So the cystic changes. And again, this is typical of chronic repetitive trauma that we see everywhere else in the body. And there are different stages, depending upon how much trauma is involved. Uh, we can actually get uh, a bipartite navicular bone with enough compression fracture of the navicular where it can actually separate into two fragments. Okay. 
uh, Robert. Um, yeah, I don't see a good navicular bone here, and there's a lot of edema about that articulation there. Um, yeah. Yeah, a lot of degenerative disease in through here. And this is really kind of an in stage Muller Weiss syndrome where the navicular bone has basically been uh, destroyed. Okay. Uh, Taysen. All right. So looks like there is extensive edema within the uh, intermediate cuneiform. Is that right? Uh, well, here it looks like this is medial, middle, and lateral cuneiform. This it's is probably cuboid. So this is probably kind of a weak image, and this is probably the lateral cuneiform, okay. which we can see here. But uh, again, the forces go right through here. In this case, it went through the navicular, uh, but the bone that, that actually uh, got injured is the, the lateral cuneiform. Okay. Uh, of the volleyball, uh, the um, uh, pelvic foot pain of the volleyball. So we have uh, uh, edema uh, involving it's uh, like medial cuneiform. Uh, this this is the cuboid. Cuboid. So, yeah. Okay. So, so this cuboid. is very lateral. Yeah. This is the fourth metatarsal. Right. We're not quite to the fifth. Uh -huh. This is the uh, distal calcaneus, mm -hmm. okay. so and this cuboid. is the cuboid. Okay, so this was three weeks after his volleyball injury. He was the son of an orthopedic surgeon, so we followed him. Uh, this is five weeks later. This is seven weeks later. So what do you think is happening here? Uh, so there was like a trabecular bone injury. And right, it's, yeah, and so it's this safe. is really... And a, a, a trabecular bone injury. And in this particular case, he was uh, supposedly out of activity. He still had some pain in seven weeks, but it was getting much better. Uh, this is a year later where we can just see some little subtle edema, but it's mostly healed. He was asymptomatic at this point and was playing volleyball again. Mm -hmm. Actually, was getting ready to go to college to play on, a, I think, UCLA volleyball team. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure that this patient was behaving himself. So they, so he said. Right, so here we see edema in the middle, or the, sorry, the medial cuneiform, the, and the base of the second right. metatarsal. Um, yeah, so so th these are midfoot fractures, okay. and you can see a lot of them. And when you do an imaging, you just have to go bone by bone and describe them. Uh, the big thing here is that this is right where you have list frank ligament. Uh, so unless you see a good intact list frank ligament, you have to assume it's torn. So uh, that that or at least comment on it because uh, that's really what key here. The the bones will heal. But if you have a list frank ligament tear, uh, the, uh, the, you're, you're not going to have proper functionality uh, uh, and you're going to end up having instability and degenerative disease. So you have to really look carefully. And if you don't see a good list frank ligament, you, you have to comment on that. And you've got to uh, assume it. You use what you may want to do is wait three or four weeks and re-image the patient to see sometimes the this frank ligament can just be very edematous from the surrounding hemorrhage uh, in the area. But but uh, you got to be very careful and follow it. Uh, and if you if you start getting any displacement or instability here, it's a surgical lesion. One, one helpful thing about uh, x-rays in this area um, the, the the middle of the second metatarsal should transect the middle of the second uh, cuneiform. Okay. And if there is any um, movement 
from that area, uh, you got a problem to, to deal with. Good. So there's an old uh, uh, advice. Uh, plus in old days, uh, well, maybe not even in old days, but uh, if the patient doesn't have enough pain after a, this ranks type of a occurrence and everything looks okay on the x-ray, but the pain is there, you may want to have the patient stand up if, they are, if they're capable and re-x-ray uh, both feet. Yeah, and uh, you'll see a separation if there's a Liz Frank's injury, that can cause a, a lot of uh, uh, eliminate a lot of problems if you don't have an MRI available. And sometimes even with an MRI, that may be something to do with a CT scan. Yeah, good. If uh, if you have a condition where you can do a CT scan in that uh, situation. Okay. Thank you. Who was last? Who's last? Okay. Uh, Robert. All right. So here it looks like there's a lot of edema in that distal fibula and looks like an avulsion fracture of that distal fibula. Right. So this is a transverse avulsion fracture, uh, right, doing inversion type injury uh, to the ankle. And obviously you have to look at the usual ligaments to, uh, to see if they're, they're involved in the actual which ligaments are involved, which other bones are involved, have to do with the amount of rotation and torque and uh, uh, the displacements at the at the time of the injury. And there's so much variation in motion of the ankle, like we've talked about before, that uh, uh, the injuries can be quite variable depending upon the details of the forces and the positioning of the ankle at the time of the injury. Tayson. All right, so looks like at the uh, metadiaphysis medially in the tibia, there's some lifting of the periosteum, uh, maybe a subperiosteal hemorrhage there. Okay, so so this patient still has not quite completely closed uh, growth plates. So what kind of a fracture is this? Um, um, okay, a buckle fracture? Okay. Yeah, buckle fracture or, or a tibial torus fracture here. Uh, yeah. Good. And these, these will heal pretty well with conservative treatment. Um, so we have uh, edema. Um, at the like tip of the um, uh, lateral, no, it's a medial, medial malleolus. Okay, and uh, there is a fracture of the tip. Okay, so this is another avulsion type avulsion. injury. Avulsion, right? Yeah, good. What would you, what would you do for that? What I would do for that? Um, it's probably surgery. I would probably put the kid in the cast because kids are ah, undependable. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of adults are not dependable, but <laughs> especially kids. So yes. I would cast this guy. This really doesn't look displaced. Oh, okay. I don't think this is really a high risk type lead. I see. Mm -hmm. So uh, it it just needs to be allowed to heal. Yeah, he'll heal within three to four weeks if you put it in a cast. Okay, so here we're looking at the on the sagittal views. We're looking at the lateral malleolus. Looks like a fracture of the distal tip there. Yeah, so so this is another avulsion fracture of the distal tip. Uh, usually it's uh, at the uh, insertion of the anterior talofibular ligament where it avulses off the tip here from an uh, inversion type type injury. Uh, the, the thing here, these are usually treated conservatively, but the, there is a bit of a problem is if these heal with a lot of displacement, 
uh, then you can end up with a situation where you'll get lateral impingement uh, risk factor for that. But I think that uh, so how how displaced they are is important. You can also get non-union of these, uh, or you end up with a kind of a fibrous union rather than than a bony union, uh, which can be associated with persistent pain. John, do you want to? Uh, I would fix it. Okay. All right. Uh, Robert. All right. Here it looks like there's more of a chronic avulsion fracture than distal fibula. Right. So this is a chronic avulsion fracture. This is someone who ended up with a chronic pain syndrome laterally mm -hmm. uh, because they didn't take uh, John's advice and didn't fix it back when uh, when it you know could have healed anatomically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Tayson. I say that th this case uh, could have been treated in a cast and healed. Um, that this case, what you do is you man manipulate the foot in such a way that you put uh, uh, re re reduce the fracture, uh, which obviously looked different from what it looks like now. At this position, if it's painful, then you either put a screw in there and try to fix it, or you remove the little ossicle. Okay. Um, it, it, it's a dealer's choice. Okay. Tayson. All right, 24 year old male right foot pain. Uh, I'm not seeing a whole lot. It looks like a, is that a accessory navicular bone? Yeah, so the the, the uh, medial navicular looks a little bit odd there, so they decided, and that's where his pain was. So they decided to get an MR scan, and it says on the old MR scan, here's what it looks like. Mm. All right, so looks like uh, they're a type two or a fracture type three accessory navicular with edema. Yeah, and edema. The edema does correlate pretty well with pain, uh, so this is a painful ostinvicularia syndrome. And here we can see the edema. There's the PTT attachment and the uh, the separation there. Edema on both sides. So, right, you know, this could be an avulsion fracture, as you say, or it could just be trauma to uh, type 2 accessory navicular. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we know, the, the, there are three types. Uh, we've gone through these before, uh, and the uh, pain is fairly closely associated with the degree of edema. So there's the type 1 where you've got uh, a bone in the distal PTT where you have the PTT all around it, and there's no art direct articulation of the, the uh, accessory bone and the, uh, and the uh, navicular type 2. It's larger, mm -hmm. and you actually have a direct articulation between the accessory bone and the navicular. And then the type 3 is uh, uh, a corneal type where you just have a large bony prominence which extends into the distal PTT uh, without uh, ascendosmosis, so a typical type 3. And again, uh, we look for bone edema and soft tissue edema, but especially bone edema to be... Uh, helpful in determining whether it's painful or not. Uh, there's going to be a problem with shoe shoe fits, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, you may want to either, either um, put it back together and heal it or, or remove it. I've done both. Okay. I can't remember having trouble with either one. Great. Uh, so, uh, Robert, did you do the last one? We did the last one. <laughs> sure, cool. Uh, I can do this one. Okay, I don't remember who did the last one. Go ahead. Why don't you do it? So, this looks like a type 3 osnovicularis with some edema in that. Uh, yeah, I. Uh, this could be a type 3. It looks like there's a little fracture line here at the, the base of the accessory navicular. Uh, here we can see a little low signal intensity on the T1 and a lot of edema on the on the T2. 
and, and this this was actually an acute fracture. And I think this was a hockey player and had an acute impaction injury from a puck that, that hit the medial side of the of the foot mm -hmm. and produced this fracture. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, they like to brag about their injuries. I played hockey, but so we pro probably should operate on them. Yeah. And here's another Although hockey. Although you can heal, heal them in a cast. Okay. I'm joking. <laughs> here's another hockey player, Tayson. What do you think about this hockey player? Um, I mean, there is some irregularity uh, at that medial side of the navicular. Okay, so this is on one fifteen oh seven, right there. That's where the pain was. Here's what the uh, images look like on the MR examination. This is just an old uh, fracture. No, this is acute. Actually, uh, I think this is a day after he was struck by the puck. Okay, there's a little bit of cortical disruption inferiorly. Yeah, and we can see this is kind of a subcortical type fracture. Uh, so it's probably a lot of contusion and a kind of a fracture line that's irregular uh, in a subcortical region. This is what the MR scan looked like right after the event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. swelling also. Yeah. And, quite, a, and, quite a bit. Yeah. And uh, nine days later, this is what the CT scan looked like. Okay, so it's more of like the resorptive phase of the yeah. fracture healing. Right. I, I, I probably would put that back in place and fix it. Okay. One, one screw should do it. Looks like pretty successful healing in the uh, okay. follow-up imaging. A little bit of persistent irregularity where we saw that uh, defect, the uh, fracture line. Yeah. Yeah. So he was just treated conservatively, but you're right. It looks like it pretty was healing. We just see a little irregularity at the edges. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you know how they treated him? They, he was treated in a in a boot. In a boot, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, go ahead, John. Not, no comment. Okay. It's uh, a matter of opinion. Yeah, Oleg, what do you think of this case? Mm. So he had similar symptoms to the ones we've just seen. Um, it's like a, a loss of like bone marrow redeem, uh, like signal in uh, maybe it's a coalition. Okay. Yeah. There, there, yeah. There, there's a navicular coalition. Yeah, uh, this was a, uh, one of the more common coalitions around the, the, the ankle. Uh, which is calcaneal correlation. Uh, and this was a fibrous correlation, but produced increased stress on the uh, uh, on the uh, lateral aspect of the navicular here and led to this uh, uh, load injury. That's a boot. If you like boots, put the boot on. Okay. Okay, on the <clears throat> ankle pain after an injury. Mm. Yeah, on the axial image on the right, it's like there's fragmentation of the distal or the tibial plafond. Um, yeah, posterior malleolar fracture. Yeah, yeah some yeah. fractures. This is an isolated posterior malleolar fracture. And usually, posterior malleolar fractures are associated with fractures of the medial, medial and or lateral malleoli as well, but this happened to be just an isolated posterior one, and this was an acute That's injury. A, a very unusual event if it's only a posterior injury. Right. Uh, at least these are treated uh, with a cast uh, if it's painful. 
um, or a boot. It, it's these these usually heal quite quite uh, nicely. Yeah, and, and one of the things that a lot of uh, referring physicians want to know is what percentage of the articular surface is involved with uh, the fracture. So it's nice to kind of measure the entire anterior posterior diameter, the tibial plafond, the amount of the, uh, the the fracture is involved, and that what percentage of the articulation is. Some people will decide on the treatment protocol based upon what percentage of the articular surface is involved. Well, that's that's a minor amount of surface, so. Yeah. Uh, if you do surgery, uh, you're, you're, you might have two problems: a surgical problem and then uh, <laughs> right. infection, etc. Or, or and and you haven't really improved all that much. Right. Good. You can always remove that fragment if you want. Good. Okay. Who's next? You. Yeah. Okay, Robert. All right, here. So here it says chronic ankle pain, and then it looks like there's some subchondral cystic change in the edema, the posterior uh, tibia. So be concerned about a, a chronic uh, osteochondral injury. Right. Yeah. Th this kind of a margin, this low, very low cyclotitsy, almost black. This kind of fuzzy little margins like this are very typical of chronic disease, and then we can see the subchondral cyst formations here. Uh, so again, yeah, that's classic for a. Uh, chronic uh, uh, degenerative disease secondary to prior trauma. Good. Taysen. All right, so it looks like there is a fracture traversing the uh, tailored dome anteriorly and extending into the posterior subtalar joint. Good. Okay. And then here we can see the axial images showing this is predominantly in the coronal plane through the uh, through the talus, and this was an acute uh, fracture. Good. Uh, just think. Why don't we stop here? Because uh, I want to then start on Taylor Dome injuries, uh, but that's a uh, more of a a longer discussion. I don't think we have enough time left in this lecture, so uh, we'll uh, we'll stop here, and we'll start at this location uh, when I get back in about ten days. Okay. When when are you back, John? Huh? Uh, I'll be back a week from next Monday. A week from next Monday. Okay. All righty. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good one, everybody. And all right, thank you, you too.